Welcome to Arc Photo Pod, the architectural photography podcast. My name is Jordan Powers, and I'm an architectural photographer based in the Southeast United States. In this episode, I speak with Molly Rose. Molly's an interiors photographer who recently moved from Southern California to Charleston, South Carolina. And when I was recently in the area, we sat down for about an hour and a half and taught shop, which is one of the things that I really appreciate about Molly. That's her business focus. We actually met online a couple years back on Clubhouse discussing business, and it's always a productive conversation when you're talking with Molly. Molly's also somebody who helps other photographers with their businesses through monthly Zoom calls, one-on-one mentoring and other online resources. So if you'd like to follow Molly and see what she's up to, you can do so on Instagram at mollyrose.photo. And if you'd like to follow me, you can do so at Jordan Powers Without the Vowels. Enjoy this episode with Molly Rose. So how's it going? It's good. It's a little slower than usual, but intentionally. Well, you so you have shoots in California though. Still. Yeah, I'm going back on Wednesday, so I'll shoot. I'm not going in May, but I have some potential travel shoots to Michigan and Connecticut in May. So I'm like trying to max out how much time I'm leaving home because like professionally, obviously it's good to kind of keep the ball rolling, but personally like move to a new city, making new friends, getting new routines. Like those things are just as important. I think, Mm -hmm. well, they're as important to me. Um, and then on the other hand, like I am trying to build my business here. So if I'm always leaving and I'm trying to set up coffee or something with new clients and I'm like, oh, sorry, next week doesn't work. I'm out of town. Well, I just lost potentially, you know, a long-term relationship that's actually more sustainable and more profitable than a relationship that I have to spend a thousand dollars every month to go back and see somebody. So I put myself in this position and I don't begrudge it at all. It's just kind of figuring things out right now. I'm definitely in transition. Like yeah. my dad has been telling me like, you are in transition. This is the biggest transition you've ever yeah. been in. I understand. So. Trust me. Yeah. So let's back, let's go chronologically. Let's just back sure. up for those not familiar with you. I've, I've known you for, I don't know how long it's been, maybe a couple years at this point. I think it's been three years. Three years. So, um, how did you, what led up to the photography thing? Have you been doing photography? What was the, what's your background? Yeah. So a hundred percent self-taught. Um, I was doing PR in LA for a wine company or a wine PR firm. And I was only there for like 11 weeks. It was like the shortest job I ever had, but I had been working in branding and marketing in Italy during college. And then I was like, okay, well, I want to go back and I want to keep working in wine. That sounds like a cool job. I had my some like my level one sommelier at that point, and I wanted to keep doing that. My boss said, you know, go for it. We'll kind of sponsor your, you know, because to get your sommelier is so expensive, not only for the courses, but you have to like know the difference between a Pinot Noir from Burgundy. That's like a very high quality. wine expert, right? The sim- yeah. Is it sim- sim- yeah. Sommelier? Yeah. Yeah. Sommelier is like the, it's the, they have like a French one, an Italian one, an American one. Different countries have it. So I was going for the American sommelier um, kind of like certification and everything. And it was so expensive and it was such a great part of my life. And I actually like still really love wine. And it's a huge hobby of mine um, for fun and just like, you know, as something I really study. So got into wine PR um, and my boss was, it was awesome. I mean, she was like, put me on a stack of magazines and she was like, email every writer and like introduce our, you know, introduce our clients. And so I really got a feel for what it was like to represent a client, reach out to a magazine, make an intro. I learned, you know, very quickly, like I would say within four weeks, I kind of understood the PR business. Mm -hmm. What got me out of that job was I was driving three hours from Orange County to LA Mm -hmm. in the morning and then a good two or three back at night. And I was just like, this is, yeah, this is awful. And at that point I had been like flipping through these magazines so much. And I was like, who are these photographers? Like, how do they get to take these pictures? And it was mostly food and wine, but there were some people like photographing wineries and that kind of thing. And I was like kind of drawn to that because my mom's an interior designer. So I quit my job. I had, I had a little camera, like a little something that just kind of got me through Mm -hmm. the next six months or something of like doing family photos and like branding and then I jumped into weddings and I really got my feet wet in everything mm. um and because my mom's an interior designer you know I was like picking up a camera shooting her stuff she had a contractor who was like can I buy those images and one thing led to another shot all of his houses and then I shot with like really just for one day with Ryan Garvin who was like I had known him since I was 17 he was just like a mentor friend of mine he like 
was just so sweet. And, you know, cause he was like a, I think he was in youth ministry and I was a youth. And so he, you know, was nice and kind of took a liking to me and showed me kind of everything. And his wife, Rebecca's awesome. And, um, I just picked it up from there and I have been doing it now for like seven years. And I always say I did it like three years really poorly. So I've been doing it like the fourth year was like good. And I would say since like the last three years, I would say it's been good. Like mm. it's been good. I I think I know how to represent my clients work really well. I take it really seriously, but there was a growing into it phase. That was a little bit something I'd like to hide from the world. Yeah. Well, I think we all kind of, I think that's one of the things that's really interesting. It's, you know, in this culture, like you're somebody who shares a lot online. Mm -hmm. Um, we, I have nothing to hide. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, a lot of people, and I don't think it's so much that people are hiding it. It's just that, yeah. like, the, all the interesting stuff is the successful stuff and the things yeah. that are actually working. It's like nobody sure. nobody really shares a lot of the of the grinding and the messiness, you know? Sure. I probably uh, haven't been as forthcoming well, no. with that. Well, but no, I, but you have, though, is, was kind of where I was getting to. Like, I've seen you post, yeah. like, kind of like the hard stuff yeah. on stories. And I yeah. think, like, you know, I think a lot of it, we're a lot more attracted to vulnerability than we like to admit sometimes, Yeah. you know? Yeah, so totally. I think, well, I think that's what we bonded over yeah. was like, we were on clubhouse, which like, I still think that is like the best thing that happened to our community. It was a good, it was good timing. Like it just happened to yeah. come out around the COVID time. It was, it was just, great. It was good timing. Uh, it was a good way for people who aren't really comfortable being on zoom and you know, just to like sit back and like listen and observe and yeah. kind of get used to how photographers banter with each other. Yeah. Well, it's also yeah. kind of like open source because with Zoom, you know, if I'm hosting a call, I have to have your email yep. in order to like get. And so like I'm all right. Like now I have your email and if I needed to, like, I don't know. I think there's something like really personal about that. Like yeah. there's a lot of trust that goes into giving someone your direct mailing address, mm -hmm. e-mailing address that I think like clubhouse was a really cool platform because you didn't have to like give anybody anything yeah you know just, you could just show up you could show up yeah. yeah and you had a and you had a reason to be there and then i don't know like that's how i met andrew bermasco who's been like a huge influence in my photography career and i like credit him with so many so much of what i've learned but also just like all that encouragement to just be who i am and like yeah. make the mistakes and everything like i was so glad i met him through there and met you and but yeah, we all were really vulnerable on that. Yeah. You know, we were all like, oh my God, like COVID sucks. Like how, who's, who's doing what, how are you getting clients? What safety protocols, if any, are you taking? I remember that was a conversation yeah. at one point because yeah. we were yeah. like, how do we get back to work? Like we yeah. were all, we were all kind of like trying to figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Cause it was those early days, but then now clubhouse is gone. Right. Is See? it actually gone? There's no, it's turned. I. I turned it back. I redownloaded the app, I think in 2022. And I just was like listening to it on walks and stuff like podcast kind of style. And I got into some rooms and there was somebody talking about how 5G causes. Yeah. Like there was like so much stuff there that I was like, yeah. wait a minute. This isn't what it. It platformed a lot of people who were. Totally. It it was almost like this. Like I think Substack has been an awesome platform that has done a lot for independent thinkers and independent writers and that kind of thing and then clubhouse is almost like the antithesis of mm. so never looked in the sub i should i've heard i've been hearing more and more people talk about it yeah i read it for i i follow a few writers there that yeah. i think are because i love writing yeah. so i follow some writing writers there that i think are interesting yeah. like reporters like that kind of thing i think i think clubhouse was good for the period of time it lasted like it started becoming very <clears throat> like culty and guru -y, guru guru -y. Um, yeah. a lot of like and it was even kind of starting to get weird in i don't want to say weird in our space but like so like with clubhouse you could start a you could have like clubs basically rooms or something. rooms yeah. but well but you could like be part of like a oh, group yeah. yeah so like i had started an architecture and interiors photography group and it there a lot of people followed it yeah, it was big. Um, but what, there were like 80 of us there. Well, on the actual calls, but there were like thousands of people who joined the thing. Uh -huh. And what was starting to ha what would start to happen is like randomly I'd see somebody like launch a uh, a random well, I, I don't want to like get into details, but there's like people starting to get on there and like sell stuff. Yeah. You know, and it's like not sell stuff, but kind of like 
you could tell that's that was the motivation. Well, and this transitions perfectly to like what we were talking about earlier. Like there is a place to sell something. Like if you're trying to help somebody or you're like doing, but because Clubhouse was social media, it felt like an insult. Like it felt a little bit like sticky and weird and yeah. crumbly and like not how you would want to be sold to. Right. It was like, let's just enjoy this for what it is and not turn yeah. and not do what marketers do and turn into a thing, yeah. you know? And, you know, admittedly, there was, there was times when like I brought, you know, Adam Taylor, for example, I brought him on to talk about licensing because yeah. that was the thing he was talking about for a long time. And he happens to sell a course, so it can come up, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, that's the thing, like his course is the course on licensing. So, yeah. but it's not like, that's what we know him for. But what happens is people, and we'll get it. Let's, let's get into this conversation later, but just to pop, put like my final thought on this really quick before we get into it later. People think that if you're selling something, like when you, when you show up and are talking with somebody, like they, like some people automatically assume, well, I'm going to be sold to at the end of this. Yeah. And it's like, it's not always the case. Like it's, yeah. I don't know. We'll talk more about that later. Yeah. Before I get too far though, I want to like touch on some of the things I talked about earlier. So you were in doing the wine stuff. Yeah. I actually have a friend who's a wine country photographer oh, in Northern wow. California. Sarah Risk? Nope. Adam Decker? Don't know. But I, I follow this girl on Instagram, Sarah Ann Risk, I think is her name. And I could like, I could spend hours just like going, and I've done it multiple times where I've gone through yeah. her whole feed, like yeah. for fun, for out of enjoyment. Her there's there's a good. very close relation like to interiors and architecture yeah. and that. In the hospitality world. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just think it's that. Finer things. It's the finer things. The That's finer a much, things much, much very good way to put that. Yeah. Um We've been rewatching The Office, so I just saw the episode That's of awesome. The Finer Things Club. And Scarf. And... Yeah, it's so funny. Um, yeah. So yeah. so you were you were doing that, and then you kind of you kind of went by that pretty quick, like everything, the transition you had, like everything. Yeah. So It was a quick transition. I mean, I knew, I knew what wasn't working, and as soon as something doesn't work for me, I, I can put it down and pick something else up it. really fast. Yeah, I can pivot fast. I don't... I don't dawdle. I don't sit on my hands. I don't try and figure it out or push it through and force it. If it's not working, boom, done. And I do that with my packages and my offers just to like talk about the business really quick. Like any package I have that isn't working or timing that isn't working, I drop it. So my proposals, which I've learned the hard way, are now only available for clients for 30 days. And if they don't like, if they don't act on that package in 30 days, because Literally something between this month and next month could change because I saw that the market wasn't responding to that offer or whatever it was. So like, you know, I'm always of the mindset of like, you have to make something that actually serves your client. Yeah. It's not about what you want to do. It's about what your client needs, what your client wants. And so those packages, that kind of thing, or, you know, those services, whether it's like branding photography, that's not what my clients wanted. They didn't want a branding session. So mm. I, you know, I took that language out of my, you know, and I, that was all that quick transition, weddings and stuff. Oh God. I mean, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do weddings. That is such a strength. And, um, do you know Mike Radford at all? He's a great wedding photographer and he's now doing interiors and he's transitioned so smoothly from weddings to interiors. And I think the best thing that I learned about wedding photography was the business side of things, selling to a luxury client, yeah. working with vendors, just having a really clean, really nice, like hospitality service kind of component to your business. Um, but I learned that I realized the photography part of it wasn't for me and I was done. So I, uh, yeah, I, I moved through things pretty quick, but I've been doing interiors for seven years. So I'm, I'm doing this, but you know, I might change little facets about it along the way as the industry changes, as my clients needs change, as my clientele grows, you know, like when I was doing a lot of like builder grade stuff, that was one offer. And that looked like one set of services, but now doing luxury custom homes with like, you know, custom pillows or something, that's going to be like, okay, now I have to add, make sure I add like details and vignettes and those kinds of things into my galleries because, you know, the, for example, this pillow that you have here, um, there's, it has two fabrics and it has just a little, uh, I think it's a half inch welt on it. That's a detail that I would shoot because the designer chose not only the front fabric, but the back fabric and the welt. And that's a story that they can tell. That's marketing for them. So I have to adjust my galleries and that sort of thing according to that level of client. Now, does everybody need that? No. Not every client is going to use that kind of photo. So knowing your clientele is also really important. 
Do you think your mom being an interior designer helped? Yeah, 100%. Facil- so, so what was that like? Were you, as you were building this, were you just kind of like asking her questions? and? So my mom and I have a fun relationship where we'll sit like this. If, if there's not a clock or we don't have like our phones, we'll accidentally sit with a cup of coffee or a glass of wine or whatever it is for like four hours, like talking about other designers that are doing this cool thing, you know, as an example, I sent her a landscape architect in Ojai, just had this beautiful pool with gorgeous um, boxwoods around the pool. And I sent it to her just like, oh, that's beautiful. We spent the next hour on the phone talking about that landscape architect and how talented he is. And, you know, we'll do that about designers. We'll do that about, you know, specific houses or buildings or hotels or restaurants or that kind of thing. So my mom and I have one of those relationships every that a lot of girls, I wouldn't say every girl, um, definitely not, but a lot of women have with their mom. We're like, they're going to talk about something and they're going to talk it to death. And that was interior design for me and food. Food it has been a huge part of my, you know, my hobbies, my relationship yeah. with my mom. Did you it. grow into that or did that, is that th- something you discovered after doing all the PR stuff and kind of taking the notice to food? Okay. No, did, it, did I grow into food? Oh, no, no. Um, just interiors in general. No, like- because when I was so little... You know, she was working. She had me 10 and eight years after my older sisters in her second marriage. So I was like a little baby. And then she was doing, you know, middle school, late elementary, middle and high school with my sisters. Mm. And so, and then she also worked full time and, you know, was very successful. So she literally would pick me up from school, throw me in the car and we would go to the pillow lady and we would go to the tile guy and we would go to the... You know, wherever there was a a upholsterer, I think she was the pillow lady that had a cocker spaniel named Peaches. And I would sit and play with Peaches for, you know, 30 minutes while she had her meetings and stuff. But what I didn't know is by osmosis, I was learning how the interior design business worked. And so, um, you know, and then little things like I, after college, you know, I'd pick up a couple hours a week just running errands for her. And I would have to go talk to the contractor and say, uh, here's your plumbing roughs or whatever it was. And so I learned some of that language and I learned how some of that process went. I don't think it's necessary to run a successful interior and architectural photography business. I, I don't think it's necessary to know all of that to be successful. What I do think is necessary to be successful in interior design photography is being curious about all of that. Mm, that's, so uh, you don't have to know all of it. That's That's impossible. And it doesn't really matter. Knowing it isn't going to be, you know, these sofas were manufactured about two years apart. It's the same sofa. It's the same sofa guy in LA. And when I ordered them, I just said, do the same thing. Well, they did a different kind of scene. This is a baseball stitch on this one. And this one's different. It's just kind of a regular scene. And when I got these, the second one, the bigger one, I was like, God dang it. I didn't ask for a baseball stitch. I should have, but I didn't. Those are the kinds of things that our designers don't miss the majority of the time they're going to be so on top of those details i didn't know to be on top of that kind of thing so like as long as i'm curious about certain things i'm going to learn them but designers are so thorough and if as long as you're curious about what they're thorough about as long as you're curious about the things that they care about i think you're going to be successful in that world just being empathetic like you're going to be successful in your empathy Mm -hmm. you might not be you know you're still you still might not be the best photographer out there but at least you're succeeding in your empathy toward your clients, which I think is what, you know, the root of all good sales. Well, I don't is. think, I don't think most clients are hiring what they perceive to be the best photographers. They're hiring the people that they, you know, that they resonate with. I mean, at least, at least my experience, at least. And if you, yeah. if you're somebody who expresses curiosity and, and genuine interest in what they're doing, like yeah. you're probably going to win out over the next person who's just, you know what I mean? Because totally. I think, look, we can we can sit here and look through magazines and books and we're going to see beautiful photos because there's experts who are curating those photos and they're deciding which photos are going to go into the magazine and they're you know because that's their livelihood as well Mm -hmm. so we're only going to see the good work of the magazine for the most part yeah but we can argue all day long as to like subject matter is like i have a whole thing about good photographers versus good subject matter Oh, 100%. it's like, I, I, it drives me crazy when, and no offense, anybody's listening, but like people fanboy or fangirl over particular photographers because of their work. And don't get me wrong. Like, I think you need to make good decisions as a photographer. Yeah, but it's really just the houses are beautiful. But it's like, if you or have a, spaces. if you have an amazing subject, like it's going to be really hard to not make 
to make bad decisions, you know? Totally. So it's like, there's, and that's another thing I have, like, it's, it's hard for me to like get behind awards and stuff like that. Nothing against like AP Almond X awards or loop design awards. I submitted something to loop design awards this year, but you know, it's like, usually the winners are like very interesting subject matter. I was, I was looking at, you know, I was looking at it a couple of weeks ago. Cause I was like, Oh gosh, you know, certain photographers have all these award things on their websites. Am I supposed to have an award? First of all, our clients, a paying client isn't going to care about whether or not you have an award. Like yeah. some, maybe some will, if it comes down to you and another guy and the other guy has no awards and everything else is the same and you have an award. Yes. It'll probably help. Well, and it also probably put a little bit of subconscious, like professional clout. Yeah. yeah you know what I mean? But, but I was like kind of looking at it cause you know, I have some time on my hands and I was like looking at the pictures that have won mm-hmm. and like, I'm, we were talking about this earlier. I don't pretend to be this like fantastic commercial architecture photographer. One, because I'm setting up a business model that allows me to be home with my non-existent children when they're home from school doing homework and making them dinner. That's my mm-hmm. business model. So I don't want to be out at night shooting strip malls or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. nice fancy buildings. Um, two, interior photos, I think don't want awards because there's, like just not enough unless it's like the whole room shot that kind of thing those can be so stunning and it has to be a stunning house but like this house for example this is a really standard ranch style home and this is 90 percent of what i'm going to shoot my portfolio is going to be standard ranch style or farmhouse homes just what's easy to build what's cheap to build Mm -hmm. this isn't i can't win an award at this and but i i think I take good pictures. I mean, I want to be humble in how I say that. I like the pictures I take Mm -hmm. and they work for my clients because they represent what my clients want and they get the job done for my clients to get more jobs like this or what's next. But yeah, yeah, I agree. Those just, those awards are, yeah, it's incredible subject matter. Yeah. And, but also not to take any credit away from the photographer, like as somebody who actually does shoot like commercial work a lot, like I know that a lot of planning and making good mm-hmm. decisions goes into that, but well, it's like, it's, it. <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's, you know, I know that again, I don't want to take any way, anything away from the photographers that, you know, yeah. that, that, but, but it's like, yeah, it, you know, I, I lived in Minnesota for 12 years, not super interesting subject matter there. Yeah. So like I had to go out and like find what are interesting buildings in the Midwest, which wasn't really easy to find you know what i mean and like you have to build a portfolio off of that i'm not going to win any awards with anything in the midwest you know and there, yeah, yeah. look there's there's some things that are interesting and i can find creative ways to shoot boring things you know and th- and that's why i'm not and, think, that's why i'm not like a world-renowned photographer because i can't right that's I'm, and i think know. maybe that's that's what we're getting to here is yeah. like i think that the simple things can be really beautiful yeah. and i think that like great composition is still great composition whether or not it's going to win an award and a great photographer is a great photographer whether or not he has the subject matter in front of him to like make people you know just drool um Mm -hmm. he or she um so yeah i think but I, i will say just to take this a level further something that a lot of photographers ask me whether i'm like formally mentoring them or not is like how do i get better houses and you make, make it look better. You can make it look better. Yeah, you have to you have to know how to style, I would say. Like you have to know like you know, for example, or hire a stylist. Or hire a stylist. Yeah, but your client doesn't always have the budget for that and stylists are expensive. Like in my experience stylists have been more have been more expensive than I am, like on the whole. But maybe someone could say I don't charge enough, I don't know, but I don't, I don't really care about that. Um what I think is just kind of, what I think is important when you're looking at your portfolio and you're trying to get better houses. The number one question I ask clients when I, when they inquire with me, um, because I want to qualify my sale is what fabrics do you use? What manufacturers do you use? What design brands do you uh, use? So over. I know, but yeah. it can, it no, can tell I, you that's... so much information yeah. about what, what paint do you use? What wallpaper do you use? Asking them in their inquiry process, like what they use and what they employ to make their designs look great. If they're telling me, oh, I shop at, you know, um, Target and CB2 and um, I, 
just thinking big box retail, restoration hardware, those are still really beautiful pieces of furniture. And in my own house, yes, I have CB2, I have Target, I have Serena and Lily stools. You know, I like, that. I have it, I got it. Like, I think everything on that shelf is probably teach it. I, yeah. I shop at those yeah. places too. So I'm not knocking those things. Yeah. But when it comes to my portfolio and what I'm trying to curate as a photographer, I'm going to pay a lot of attention when someone says Schumacher, yeah. Dovetail, Noir maybe. I'm going to pay attention to those, you know, those names that you're going to see at High Point or Vegas Market or the the design brands that are going to be direct to, or not, not direct to consumer, they're going to be wholesale. A designer's going to need to have an account. Um, I'm going to pay attention to when a designer says maybe even something stupid like Faro and Ball versus bare paint. I mean, it's paint. Anybody can buy paint and, and, and paint is going to be, that color is made by, you know, bear and it's made by Sherwin Williams and it's made by what, but there are more expensive paints than others. And it's not just money, but sometimes there are things that qualify the sale that say, oh, this designer maybe isn't using these fabrics or these furniture brands or this paint yet, but I just ask them, what do you like? And if they say they like these things, even if their project right now doesn't look like that, I'll take them and we'll work together. And then I'll watch them grow into all of those different things that they're working toward. Plus I know at the beginning of our relationship, the quality of home and the quality of design that they're looking ahead and saying like, I cannot wait to use a Philip Jeffries, you know, grass cloth wallpaper in a bathroom one day. And then I get to celebrate that big win with them when they get it and make sure that those photos nail that big win for them. Yeah. Right. So like, that's what I think a design partnership looks like. That's what I think qualifying a sale looks like to get, you know, getting those non builder grade homes. My house is builder grade actually, like this is a flip and it's been hilarious because now I have to like admit that I live in a flip and I'm like, then this like, kind of stickler asshole about like, like custom cabinetry millwork. And I'm like, oh my, God, my cabinets make me want to like die. But it's not well, because, yeah, but I mean, they're beautiful and everything's beautiful yeah. in our house. But I mean, it's just because now I've developed the eye to be so yeah, okay, picky yeah. about my portfolio. Yeah. And my portfolio is something entirely separate from my regular life. Mm -hmm. My regular life is very humble. I wear like Levi jeans and I shop at like H&M and I'm like super casual. I never, I'm not fancy. Mm -hmm. Like drive a, 12 year old car target jeans no no i've got target oh target jeans. i was like i don't wear target <laughs> jeans but that's because they don't really fit me right yeah. but you know my car's 12 years old i'm not a super material person but when it comes to my portfolio and what i want my work to look like i'm really picky yeah so I, that's how i think you get your portfolio to grow well but also your clients are seeing that like you're asking them those questions yeah and it, it's communicating to them oh they actually care about what I care about, mm -hmm. you know, and, and those things. Um, it's that empathy piece again. Yeah, empathy. But it also, I can almost guarantee you that, like, I'd have to go and look to, to give some actual evidence, but I don't think most photographers are thinking about those things. You know what I mean? Like, their, their yeah. questionnaires on their website probably don't have questions that let the clients help know. Help yeah. Your help. Like, I want to help them think like their client. Don't think like you. Yeah. You're not selling to you. Mm -hmm. You're selling to a client. So what are your client's problems? Yeah. What's your client lying awake at night thinking about? Mm -hmm. That's how you're going to build a sustainable business where you know, okay, I'm going to make 25K every single month and I don't have to worry about where that money's coming from. Have you, have you read uh, Story Brand? Don't no, Story Brand. by Donald Miller, no. Yeah. But my, my one friend, Katie uh, Casada, I'll plug her. She's a, like a story coach and everything. Okay. So. I think it's similar. That's, that's but, essentially what you're doing. I mean, it's yeah. the same thing. You're making the customer, the client, the hero yeah. of the story or whatever okay. of your business. Yeah. Like it's not about you. It's about them. And yeah. by doing those things, you're essentially doing, and that, you know, there's a suggested like framework for how your website should look, but I think ultimately it's the messaging. Oh, should we get into the website conversation? Let's, but not quite yet. Cause I do want to talk about that. But, um, yeah, as far as like intake, like I, I actually switched mine up probably four months ago. Well, at the beginning of the year, so I switched from kind of, what to what from just a basic contact form, like, uh, Same email. Yeah. Basic. Yeah. I think it, maybe I had a couple extra questions, but now I've got, cause since I'm marketing mostly to commercial, it's very transactional and very unemotional. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm right. usually dealing, it's usually a marketing person hiring me. Right. Um, who's so, looking for results. 
looking for results. So yeah. it's like all my questions are like bullet pointed. Basically, it's like, what is the what are you calling this project? Like, what's the project name? What's the address? How many photos are you looking for? And I kind of like hint at a suggested budget range. Um, do you are you wanting to publish this anywhere? Like, I'm basically just trying to get a sense for like, I'm only asking questions that are relevant to the scope of the project. Yeah. yeah. And I can't tell you I've gotten I've never had anybody compliment me on a contact form before until I switched to this. Like people yeah. are like, that was so thorough. Like yeah. that was like so helpful for me to because it helps them think through those things. Right. Like, oh, who, who, what other parties were involved that may want to cost share these things? It's, I don't put all of that right on my contact form. It's in my inquiry process, but now I'm going to think about putting that right on my contact form because... Look at mine. See if you think yeah, it's... Yeah, I love that. Yeah. I love that. I mean, I have some of those pieces on my contact form, but because the, the way that I think about my inquiry process is like the inquiry part, the first contact point is like we're going to work together as a whole and I'm going to like sell you, sell you. I'm going to engage you in a relationship that's longer term, all encompassing of many of your projects, not one. Mm -hmm. And then I get into the, the lead kind of, I qualify that project, you know, yeah. we go through a questionnaire for that specific project and booking that one project. It's not always like, yeah, but I, I don't know. I'm going to think about that because maybe there are pieces from that that I can pull out for the greater relationship that would tell the client, oh, here's what I'm looking at when I'm looking at individual projects. Well, one of the things that I think is helpful is that I've made, I've made, well, there's two contacts. For, so if you go to my website, there's two contact forms. One is a general, general inquiry. One is an actual project quote contact form. The, both of them have like a mandatory like name, your contact information, essentially. Yeah. And then all the project information is optional. They don't have to fill it all out. So it's, they're not like being forced to fill it all out. It's just, I say this is completely optional. It just helps speed up the conversation. Sure. But I think also it depends on your clientele. Like you want to nourish longer term relationships. You know, I'm, I think my clientele, it's more that I'm assuming that most of them are just going to be like one and done. Yeah. Probably 90% 90, 90 of my clients are going to be one. Yeah, see, mine's different. It's yeah. a long-term thing. So I think I think I would almost be cautious on like doing stuff like that because you don't, maybe for like an initial yeah. inquiry, just so people can kind of get used to the questions you might ask. Yeah. And also just to kind of show them that you care about those things. Mm -hmm. But I feel like... There's also, like for me, there's something to be said. I like I like having sort of like you knock on the door I answer and then I open the door. So that's kind of how like I look at it. Like mm -hmm. they knock on the door with their first in court, their first contact, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. I answer the door with an email that says like, let's set up a phone call. That's what I do. And when they set up the phone call, then I open the door and I ask them the questionnaire before. So that questionnaire only goes out once they've taken the action of scheduling a 30 to 45 minute phone call. That's a huge thing for somebody. That's yeah. a lot of time to give to a photographer. Um, so when people don't schedule that phone call, I automatically know I'm not going after that lead. I just, if you don't have time to like discuss certain things, you know, that are relevant to your job, I'm not going to chase you down. Right. But the people who do fill it out, I get really excited because I'm like, it took a ton of time, yeah. you know, and I know that took a lot of time. I, you might like this. I actually have, if somebody fills out all of the questions that I have on my form, I actually have, I bought a Starbucks gift card oh my gosh. with a barcode and I have an automation set up to where if they fill it all out, I said, Hey, it, the automation sends them an email and says, thank you for taking the time to fill all that out. Here's a Starbucks gift card. Like just bring this to your next, uh, next time you go to Starbucks and scan the code and you'll get your next coffee's on me. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. I got that from somebody else. I can't remember where. Do you but, use Zapier for your automation? No, I, I use a, a thing called paper form for my actual, oh, okay. uh, into like my contact form. And, yeah. and I also have my contracts built into that. Oh, that's really cool. Um, but I've, it's got a lot of conditional logic yeah. built into it. And, you know, based on whatever they fill out, I can have other things pop up and cool. I've I, used that. I years. use like a, such a mix of things like type form and I have so yeah. many things going on. So that's what I was I hope, I hope, well, I hope to one day have an all encompassing all in one software, but, yeah. but anyway, I don't want to. Get too I far know away that's from. like so that's so detailing yeah yeah, yeah. Kind of um thing. but 
No, I think the conversation is more surrounding like knowing your clientele. Yeah. And knowing like I'm big on that. Yeah. I'm big on that, and it's something that I'm folk. I've been now. This will. This is where I have a target on my back. I think in some circles. I am not only about knowing my clientele, but I also know my competitive landscape pretty well. And I'm not using that information against people. I would never like, oh, well, that photographer does that yeah. to a client or anything, but I know where I am in the market. I know what quality of photos I deliver. I know what level of service I provide to my client. I know, you know, a handful of factors that tell me kind of what my competitive landscape looks like and I know what I need to do to close a sale. Hmm. And are you able to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. I mean, I like I know like I know I have a target on my back about this and what do you okay, let's talk about that. What do you mean when you have a target on your back? What what is your perception of this? Like what or what do you what have you seen at least? I'll get messages from photographers being like, you know, you don't charge enough or you give away too much for free, but it's like they don't know the full picture of like all of my packages, all of my services, because I have all the cart things that like somebody can just add on little things to their project as needed. Um, when that happens, that's like a very expensive invoice. But if somebody wants to like buy in totally as like Molly, as my photographer, my publicist, my marketer, and I'm doing everything for them, yeah, yeah they're getting a break. Like it's not like, and they're going to get a break on photography because they're also paying for PR. They're paying for marketing. Like the photography at that point is like the thing that I can get. It's like your, it's like your gateway drug. It is my <laughs> gateway drug. And so when photographers hear those raw numbers associated with, or they, the terms or whatever it is associated with the photography, they're like, oh, like, why would you do that? You're cutting, you're undercutting the rest of us. I'm like, honestly not. I don't see it as that because of how much else I'm doing. Like yeah. it's not just photography. And the number is still quite high. It's I'm, I charge enough money where I can do two shoots a month and I pay all my bills. You know what I mean? Like I don't work that much. And right. as much as I did, and especially since my cost of living has gone down so much. So I want to talk about that too. That's interesting to me because I'm also in a yeah moving thing. Yeah. Moving. But, but before we get to there, yeah. so, so I, I think there's a, thing in our community that there's a lot of short-sightedness in yeah. our community like there's a lot of like and i think a lot of this because like most photographers don't come from they don't have like the entrepreneurial or they don't come from a business background or yeah, totally. you know maybe maybe they've they're so used to like working in exchange like you know the time you spend should equal x amount of value and they're not thinking about like you know there's just not I mean, I think I there's think not a very big uh, circle. The way I the way I put it is, photogra photographers are very egotistical people. It can be for sure. Yeah. yeah, and if you can if you can say, all right, I'm gonna kill my ego for a deal. What's gonna happen? You know, take a risk, take a jump. And um, I listened to a podcast a couple weeks ago that my husband Zach sent me because he he owns his own business too, and so he's he's competing all the time against his counterparts and. We're, we're both, we, we keep each other really hungry that way. And he sent me a great podcast. I'll find it. Um, you know, maybe you can link it or something, but the premise that I really locked onto was, so what? Okay. You charge less than your competitors. So what mm -hmm. are you paying your bills? So what are you happy with your services? So what, like, are you really going to structure your whole business over something that someone else says is negative about what you're doing and how you're serving your clients? If your clients are happy, you're happy. You're not burnt out. You're doing a quality of work that you like and you want to continue doing. And the price is right. I mean, no one else can tell you that it's wrong. I, I agree and I disagree. And I'll, okay. I'll explain. So I think that, and you have also, I, mean, I would say, yeah, $500 is wrong. Right, right. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, so I, I also come from a real estate photography background. Yeah. So it's like, I'm in a situation now where it's like I can like so I'm I'm more focused on architectural photography these days. Mm -hmm. I don't market real estate photography at all. But over the last couple of years, there's been like you know five or six courses that have come out on real estate photography, and I know because I help produce some of them. Right. Um, but it's like there's other courses that have come out where it's like it's 
like good enough is what's kind of preached. You know, like don't, it's not about becoming a photographer. It's not about learning photography. It's about the business and it's about like building a commodity essentially. Mm -hmm. And what's, what starts to happen is that, you know, you do have people that come into the market with no photography experience, significantly undercutting and driving down the overall value of the market. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, eventually time, time will let that they'll burn out with time. Let me, let me qualify this by saying, I'm, I'm saying if you're, if you're charging multiple of thousands of dollars for what I would say our level of work is, and I don't know who's watching. So if we're doing a qual a certain quality of work and that certain quality of work is earning you, let's say multiple thousands of dollars, I'm talking about that person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not talking about the guy who's like, oh, Molly charges X. I'm going to go out and charge $250 for the same thing. And one, you're going to, you're going to misrepresent my client's work. Cause if you're charging $250, you're not getting you're not paint colors, right. right. You're not, you're not getting any of that. Right. And that's the kind of stuff that I spend time. And on. you're also going to burn out on it and you're going to leave them hanging. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So, I mean, we don't even need to talk about that person. Right. When I say we're an egotistical bunch there are there have been conversations i've been in where people want to be making as much money as like a lawyer or a doctor or something like that fine good go for it like that is great and i empower that and i think you should do that and let me know how the view is from the top but the amount of like work and angst and just like what i would have to do to get to a twenty thousand dollar a day photo shoot I'm not willing to do. And I've gone, I've jumped through the hoops and I know that about myself. Now, if somebody says I'll offer you $20,000 a day for a photo shoot, I will take it. Of course. I'm not, I'm not money averse. I just know my clientele. I know my market. I know my services. And I also know how much time. This is the people, this is a thing that I don't think people really know about me. I am extremely data oriented in my business. So I know how much time every single thing takes. I know how much time it takes me to pitch a project for PR to get it submitted into a magazine. I know how much time it takes me to get an uh, image licensed. Yeah. Everything you have in your business is proportioned out. Yeah. So my most competitive offer looks like something that's undercutting the market, but I'm actually just getting to profit as quickly and as efficiently as possible and saving all of this time on the end, all the hoops I have to jump through to get to what I would think, you know, is what that, that photo is worth. Photo's not worth like photos worth what you're, somebody's willing to pay for it. Yeah. You know, and we can assign a value. We can set a price. You know, I was just talking to Zach this morning. You never know where somebody's getting money from. You know, you could have a client who has a great grandpa that passed away and left them $1 billion. And they're going to, in their business, act like you and me. They're not going to act like they have a billion dollars. So you can tell them, oh, the photo shoot's going to cost $2,500 or the photo shoot's going to cost 10. The factors on their side are unknown. Mm -hmm. The factors on your side are what you can control. Yeah. And that's the game that you're playing. Mm -hmm. You're not playing with their money. You're playing with yours. Mm -hmm. And so the model that I run is what is my quickest path to profit. And then when I assign an, a value of profit that I want to make that's comfortable for me, for my family, for my business, I define that as my success. And if I have more than that, I'm blessed. If I have less than that, I'm blessed and I got to learn a lesson. Mm. And if I meet that number, great, I can maybe relax a little. At what point do you decide that it's time, like you just revert back to basic supply and demand? Like, I just don't have the time to do all this. Like, at what point do you determine it's time to maybe increase increase what my rates 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 let's just say that yeah i'll increase rates during supply and demand kind of stuff i mean i also know what the general market is so i'm not gonna i'm not gonna undercut anybody you know i'm I'm not going to undercut the people i'm directly kind of competing with so if it's going to be people in south carolina if it's going to be people in california or any travel rates i mean i generally know what things should cost um maybe i'm less than someone but I'm, or maybe I'm more than someone, but that's, that is so within, like, let's say that's just in flux on a spectrum. That's kind of like, we're all operating on a spectrum here, not yeah. fully here. So I'm going to be in this spectrum. Um, 
I'll raise my rates when I have too much work or when I start realizing I'm actually achieving results for my clients that I'm working on for them. So if they say, I want more Instagram followers, that's a vanity metric, but it's a great metric because yeah. I can track it. Um, if they say I want more media submissions, it's a hell of a lot more work for me. I'm going to raise my rate for that. Mm. Like I'm going to charge them more money if they want me to be, you know, emailing editors. So, every so day. It's, you're you're using a value based approach. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I am. I mean, I I haven't probably read all of the books, and I know there's like a treasure trove of resources on value based. I'm listening to um, Chris boss right now okay um a book by him and that's been really interesting just figuring out just how to even close the same well i mean essentially you're just yeah. basically you're increasing your rates based on the value you provide i mean it sure. boils down to that essentially yeah and then i also you're, have you're charging proportionate to the and to then the i also value. have a scalability factor of if they want more photos they you know more like more services cost more yeah more photos cost more mm -hmm. there's like a couple baked in packages and then anything on top of that is more. But, um, again, it's my most efficient way to profitability. Yeah. And there's a certain amount of work I'm willing to do up to a certain point. And then after that point, everything in my contract is clear and not just in my contract, my packages are clear. Every, every piece of communication I have with my client is like so clear. I don't get my toes stepped on anymore. I used to a lot. People would run me around. It doesn't happen anymore. So, um, yeah, I, I, I like my prices. And again, I may have a target on my back from some people, especially the way I license, I think is a little gritty, but I've had lawyers check it and it's all good. Like, whatever, like it works yeah. for my business and it works for my clients. Mm -hmm. It works for my clients. Maybe it doesn't work for other photographers, but as long as those clients are working with me, it really shouldn't affect them. I, you know, I just think that people feel threatened by, I, I don't know, there's... um. It's a, it's like a scarcity mindset in some sense. Yeah. You know, even if, even if they're not like a direct competitor, well, I think that there's like a fear that sets in when I, I just, I see a lot like in the yeah. Facebook groups and everything, when people are doing something perceived, what they perceive as wrong, mm -hmm. like people just get. And I empathize with that. Like I, I, do, do. I do to an extent, but at the same time, it's like maybe just have a conversation about it and like figure out where the other person's coming from or, or uncover some other information you're not yeah. aware of. And I've started hosting these monthly calls for photographers. Cause like you, I want you to get to know me and ask me those questions yeah. and say it to my face. I don't like, let's talk about it. Is this something that could work for you? Like, mm -hmm. do you want to borrow this model and try it out? And if it works for you, great. Mm -hmm. If you absolutely hate this and you think I am like the devil incarnate for doing this, the fact that this is at the end of the day, my business is important to me. Yeah. What's more important to me is my husband, my family, my pets, the l beautiful life I get to live, the meals I'm going to eat with the people I'm going to meet. I don't, not, this is not, this is not my, this is not the hill I'm dying on. Yeah. You know, this is so important to me and I take it really seriously and I act like a professional and I do a good job. I do quality work and I take care of my clients. Mm -hmm. But it's not everything, yeah. you know. So I think. Well, I mean, a lot of people have their entire identity wrapped up into this, which is, I can understand. I can empathize with that a little bit too, because for the longest time, and I wrapped my entire identity up in, like, being a business owner. Like, you know, I, I think that yeah, you've evolved thing. in the last couple of years on that too. I mean, we've had some life yeah, conversations yeah. around. Yeah, it. I mean, for me, it was like, and, and I I see a lot of photographers and especially in the real estate world, there's a lot of people who are like very comfortable sharing, um, you know, that they're doing well mm -hmm. financially and everything. And it's like, cool. That's awesome. And I, I understand that because, you know, there was a period of time where I was doing really well with real estate, but it's like, it's, it's kind of a false. It's like we, a lot of us just stumbled into this. Yeah. Like there, there's nothing special. And what's doing well anyways? I mean, yeah, you can make 500 K doing something, but are you, how are you? What are you interested I'm, in? I'm also fresh <laughs> off of reading the book outliers for the first time. Have you ever read that? No, I have it. I have okay. It. Yeah. I, I, I literally just finished it yesterday uh, for the first time. I'm a big Malcolm Gladwell fan, but okay. I, for some reason haven't read that book. Yeah. And, um, I'm realizing like, you know, there's nothing special about us 
and like w everything we get you know, like it, yeah it's it's all circumstantial like we've all stumbled into this business one way or another we've all stumbled like in the areas we live the clients we have like the personalities we've been like formulated over the years like nothing is because we're awesome okay well i i want to <laughs> like i kind of want to say the opposite okay go for it so what i would say is like there's only so many ways you can photograph four walls floors and a ceiling yeah. like or exteriors there's only so many things you can do there's only so many lights you can try there's only so many lenses you can buy you're li you're gonna hit a limit and so when you compare your business on apples to apples with other photographers you're missing an opportunity to say i have an orange it. here's what makes me different here's yeah. what makes me special here's why you should choose me yeah but i'm i'm i i 100 agree what i'm saying is that like we get so comfortable in what we have built that it, that it becomes like i don't know we, we think we think what we built is 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 the special thing understood yeah you know versus like what just who we are uniquely you know what i mean yeah. i guess that's kind of where i was going totally and yeah. that the thing you've built should be empowering the things that you really, like you're actually about your life. The beginning of this year, let's say it was February or early March, Zach asked me because I was really in a work mode mm. and he called me out on it. We're driving somewhere and he goes, so what are your personal goals this year? And I like started laughing. I was like, I don't have any. And I like went home and I wrote, I, I use Notion and I like use Notion for everything because I'm obsessive. And I wrote like my 2023 vision planning and I knocked out my work goals like that so fast. January, February, March, I, everything. I want to hit this. I wanted this kind of client. I want to shoot this kind of house. Blah, 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 blah. I like wrote down for March, like host a dinner party. Mm. Like April, like go to the Bahamas. I was like, I don't like... I don't want to go to the Bahamas. Like I couldn't even figure out like what my personal goals were because I was so out of touch, you know, and it comes, it's everything cyclical. Like I'm probably going to hit in the summertime as usual, I'm going to hit the ground so hard in work. I'm going to be head in the sand about my personal life. I do it every year. Um, I'm trying not to, but you know, I was like, oh my God, I don't even have personal goals right now. That is a huge red flag to yeah. me. I need to have a personal vision so then we started you know zach and i had conversations like what do we want to do as a family what do we want to do as a couple what do we want to do you know we got another puppy that was like i know some people think more animals are crazy i want like 100 animals i want a hobby farm so like getting another puppy was like really great and i was like okay this is what this is what i love to do i want to be around my animals like mm -hmm. i want to be around the people i love so yeah personal goals like going to the bahamas sure that would be great it's not really a goal that's not really what i'm about what i'm about is like the daily life i'm living going over to miss sue's house who lives next door having a glass of wine with miss sue after work on a thursday night and watching tv with her talking about how the world is coming to an end like that is more important to me um and so yeah that's what i'm hinging my ident identity on but if my business doesn't support those things or is taking away from those things uh, that needs to be my new cue going into the rest of my, hopefully my life. And I don't know, we'll see how long that lasts, that life thing. Yeah. Um, we're not here long, but right. if that is cueing me that I'm getting, if my business is becoming more important than those things, I don't want to do that anymore. That's why we moved to Charleston. I don't want to be like that anymore. I, I just don't want to do it. So and that probably segues. Stin. So, so, so I'm basically kind of the same reason we were, you know, we were in Minnesota, we were doing the, uh, sorry, no, it's fine. Um, just like the grind and we're just, it was time to just get out of Minnesota. So like, we were like, let's move South Nashville is kind of on the radar because that's where all the work that I wanted to do was. Okay. So we were like, let's just do Nashville. Um, anyway, what was the driving? Like so I went to university of South Carolina and I loved it there. Like I loved going to USC. And so Charleston was always on my radar. Zach and I met, I don't know, four or five years ago. I don't know. Um, and when we met, um, cause I'd mentioned, I love food and sustainability. And my mom is a slow, she was like a slow food person, organic food, like way back when she went to like the slow food festival in Italy and like all that. Mm. And so eating well and like sourcing like zero kilometer meals, like that's what Zach and I bonded over. Like, and I know that that's sounds really weird, but um, 
you know, it was a, it's a huge part of our life that we source fish and meat and everything responsibly. And unfortunately, that means hunting. And like, there's nothing for. I mean, yeah, I know, sorry, but, I know there's some. Uh, it's it's yeah, like, right. But hunting and fishing is a big part of Zach's life. I mean, I don't hunt. I've I don't think I've ever fired more than a BB gun, and I'm not really interested in ever doing anything more than that. Uh, so we, you know, yesterday we drove around for four hours scouting for turkey and took the dogs and went to like this beautiful place and just enjoyed time together. And it wasn't far from home and we just get to be closer to nature here. The culture kind of supports that kind of hobby, I think in a nice way, not that it's necessary, but you know, people don't look at us sideways when it's like, Oh, Zach's hunting today. And I'm, yeah. and I'm gonna, you know, I'm here at this party alone or whatever it is, you know, it's kind of normal here. Um, and I think, you know, Charleston has a lot to offer in terms of interior design and architecture. I mean, if we're talking about work, I, what what more beautiful, more historic place could you live? You know, maybe Savannah, maybe New York. I mean, there's not some, so many places that are this beautiful, this historic. The layers, the textures, the depth of photography that um, I hope to get to do. I have only shot like one or two things here so far. We've been living here for almost six months, so still very much working in California, but um, that was a big reason for moving here. And then cost of living is huge. I mean, what we bought this house for uh, was, this is basically a condo, not even in Costa Mesa where we used to live. This would be a condo in like Santa Ana, Tustin, great areas of Southern California, but like not where our life was, you know? And so we're like, well, not that they're that far, but like if we're gonna leave our community, we might as well leave our community. Right. And so found this house and we owned it within 20 days, wow. like found it to owning it. I mean, it was fast because the escrow process in South Carolina is fast. So yeah. it all happened fast. Um, it was an adjustment. It was hard. Everything about it was hard. And, um, you know, it's been hard to let go talking about identity. It was hard to let go of my identity as like an up and coming California photographer. I mean, I, that was kind of how some clients had referred to me. Oh, you know, I was getting inquiries from people. I can't even, I probably, I can't say I was getting the most unbelievable inquiries and I like left and said, okay, God do something with that jump. Yeah. If you want to do something with that jump. Mm. And if I jump into something else, can't wait, let's see where it goes. You know? So Charleston so far has been like, I said, Zach and I've been talking about like the last couple, like last week or so. Like we can't tell friends anymore at home in California. Or this is home. We can't tell friends in California anymore how good it's going here because it just must sound so annoying. Because everything is going so well here. Yeah. Like our life here is exactly in pace with who we are as people. California just wasn't that anymore. It just it wasn't that anymore. You know. Yeah, that's a very similar similar stories. Like everything, yeah. like everything that we experience in Minnesota, except for being Minnesota versus California. Uh, Big differences but i mean just like pace of life was a lot like because we first moved to nashville and nashville was kind of insane yeah um, totally. and then we decided to go to the like a small town in the mountains like in north carolina yeah. so it's like that fits our lifestyle a little bit more but yeah. like i still work in nashville so i'm yeah. still there once or twice a month because that drive it's like four and a half hours okay. but it's like Dude, so, I would take a four and a half hour drive over flying cross country. Yeah, well, through the, it's also mm -hmm. through the mountains, so it's kind of like you know it's pretty at least. There's like an hour long stretch where it isn't pretty, but there's a Bucky's there, nice. halfway through, which makes up for it. Nice. So, like I can do the magic with that. of a Bucky's. Yeah, makes so, everything better. So it's like it's like you know, um, yeah, I can completely re relate to all that, and I don't know. There's, are you no? Are you still? actively promoting yourself in California, you're kind of letting that kind of wean itself yeah, out. Yeah, because, or... you know, going back to the how much I charge conversation, I'm not going to say it, um, but I charge enough that it, it's fine. I can go back to California. Yeah. I mean, I do well. I can work, like I said, two days a month and I pay my bills and have a little bit extra to spoil my dogs um, mm -hmm. or, you know, whatever I want to do. So I, I'm never going to not work in California. I have a great clientele there and it may just be that the frequency slows down, which has already started to happen because I'm not making myself as available there, but for projects that count, I mean, I was meeting with a designer here in Charleston on Friday who's from LA. I mean, for her projects, if she called me and those are two or three day projects, I mean, they're really, really important. Um, 
sometimes celebrity homes, sometimes, you know, just very high budget mm -hmm. homes where there's a lot of details to capture. She calls me, I'll be like, yeah, name your time. Like, I'll be on your schedule here. Like, let, let's freaking go. I would love to shoot more of your stuff. And it's not that I'm price gouging her. It's just that what I charge for what I do makes sense that I still fly to California. Yeah. It also makes sense for me to still work in South Carolina. I just don't yet have the clients here to leave California completely right. to the dust. But also the creative aspect. There are people in California I still want to shoot for. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. I want to, I've, I've, I'm like starting a slow, mild rebrand. Um, and my website's down right now. I'm doing a full rebrand. Oh, really? I just started it this morning. Well, installing it. Well, I've been, so I've been like, you go to my website, it's Jordan Powers Interiors and Architectural Photography. Now it's, I'm basically just calling myself an American architectural photographer. I love that. Taking out the interiors all together. Mainly because with all this moving, I've realized like I don't want to just be pigeonholed into one area. Yeah. And I do really enjoy traveling. Like, That's cool. Like, a, I don't want to travel a lot. Yeah. Like, I'm realizing like I've I've had a lot of travel, which is one of the reasons I'm here. This is actually supposed to be a vacation. This is the first vacation that I'm working. Well, this is different because um, well, one, my family is not here yet. Like, so I'm yeah. I came here a little earlier so we could do this. But oh, thanks. the rest of the week is like my first actual. What are vacation you guys staying? we're staying in an airbnb somewhere downtown i have no idea i gotta look it up on the gps i'm not sure where yeah. yeah but it's um but my point is it's like you know this is my first actual vacation and it's like going back to that identity conversation and the personal goals it's like all i've done is work for the last several years and part of the reason for coming down south was to escape the, the grind mm -hmm. But all I've been doing since we moved down here is just like working, working, working. And I know that that's like the most boring conversation. I feel like if a photographer is listening to this, they want to hear us talking about like settings and business. But like, I think you get to a certain point where you're like, how, what are you doing with your personal time? Like, what are your personal yeah. goals? Like, or even like great conversations around like finances. Like how much like, you know, I have, there's some, some photographers I know that are like, I'm not spending any, I'm not investing any money in my business this year. And I'm like, Let's talk about that. I want yeah. to hear about it. Like, I'm kind of interested in that. You know, there's a certain point where you're like, I don't need to spend any more money. I've kind of bought all the things. I've bought all the gear. I've invested in all the things. Now I get to reap the benefits. Okay, what does that look like? You know, there's certain conversations that like aren't sexy because it's not for the community that's maybe like, I don't know. I mean, it's still for a growing community. It's just not as sexy as like old systems and inquiry forms. And right, right. Not well, that stuff. <laughs> I was going to say, depends on who you're asking. Yeah. Uh, no, I hear you. There's actually a podcast, uh, Shooting Spaces, I think they've put it out already, about like retirement. Like. Oh, yeah, they did. Like, they put it out. Yeah. yeah. So, so you know, uh, there's photographers out there that don't even have a savings at all. It's like, yeah. ooh, that's, that's scary. Um, that's a whole other conversation. I wish we, I know we're running out of time, yeah. but one conversation I wish we could get to is like running a business as a photographer like you have your other business and everything and what i'm really curious about is like joining forces with somebody and i haven't mm. like another equally great business-minded photographer and being like what does the power of two look like and i don't i don't know i mean but i like i've mentioned i'm i don't cling to my brand like that like i don't cling to my editing style i don't cling to my um, shooting style, I think that I'm flexible and I can adapt to somebody else's standards if they hold their standards higher than maybe I hold mine. I hold my standards high. Yeah. I mean, I hope that my work shows that. But if my it client does, yeah. says, I want dark and moody, I'm going to put my client ahead of myself and say like, yeah, I'll do that for you. Like, let's go. Let's try it. You know, I think you and I think a lot alike. Like you probably come up with just random business ideas based on like five words somebody says. Maybe not yeah, business maybe. ideas, but yeah, like maybe. ideas for your business. Yeah. Um, like the way you bring somebody else on or like partner with somebody is you bring them on to offer something somebody else isn't doing. So, hey, if you have an interior design client who wants to start doing video, you outsource. Yeah, if you're, yeah. not, if you're, not, if you're not doing video, you bring somebody else on who does do video mm -hmm. and just up charge. Yeah. You know. I, what I'm, I'm mostly curious about how I want to have another photographer because I want to basically oh, yeah. be able to clone myself. Right. I want to be able to like offer dual power mm. and still like have a family and stuff. So well, could you just like maybe train like an apprentice or something? I hate saying that sounds so pretentious, but like bring on somebody else and then like 
essentially if people want to hire yeah. Molly Rose photography, it's like they can hire your associate under this you. Is, this is something that I would say is like pipe dream. I have spent very little actual brain power on because to me it's so, it's like almost not, it's not that it's not worth it. It's just like, it's so hard to figure out and it's so risky. So I don't know. Have it's, it. the, it's the problem with a service-based business. I mean, it's like, yeah. it, it's pretty much just you unless you yeah. have a way to scale it. Yeah. I'm in transition in my life. I'm in transition in my business in a lot of ways, but, um, yeah, but talking about branding, like rebranding and stuff right now, which I think I'm excited about. And one thing I, you said, you want American architectural photography. I want to be just interior photography, but I'm worried that sounds like I don't have the capabilities to take exterior shots because sometimes our clients don't know, like they don't have that. Like, I'm not going to say exterior photography. Yeah, so right. anyways, um, there's just like a lot of like funny things there when you're branding and it's like, oh man, there's, yeah. a, lot, there's a lot to it. So. it. It is. And it's like, you're, we, I think we also overthink it a lot. Like how many people actually pay attention to that? I know. You know, but it's like, I don't know, like I, I do get obsessive about it. Like I kind of want to move things around until like it's a comfortable spot and then I set it in there and then I'll revisit it a couple years later. Well, yeah, it, it, you know. it'll adjust. It'll move. Yeah. I like never say never. Right. You know, I, I've learned a little bit of like how Stephen Carlish does his lighting now and now I'm reconsidering if I even want to start incorporating lighting the way he does it into my workflow and it's like, man, that's going to change. And if I do, that's going to change a lot of the way I do things, Yeah, you know. Not that I don't know how to do lighting, but now I see it in a different way. Yeah. You know, and I see like it's maybe part of the composition. a different, different way to use it, you know, yeah. and it's like, oh, okay, well, now I got to start considering that. Yeah. So and it, there's a lot to consider. Um, it's an evolving process. Um, this, the coaching, you do coaching and you've got some online things. Yeah. Like, are you like playing with the idea of coaching? Cause I feel like coaching almost sounds like like money mindset. I know. Like, I that I've I'm, I've tried to avoid the word coaching too, yeah. which is easier to say because it's just common. Yeah. Like I prefer I prefer like mentoring. That's what I call it, like know? a mentorship. Yeah. Like uh, I, Adam, Adam Taylor calls it consulting, which oh, it kind of really is. Nice. Yeah. So um, yeah, because there's a lot of it where I'm like, you're gonna like basically ask me to be your boss for a day, and yeah. I'm gonna like ask you to do things that you might not be disciplined or not have the know-how or not want to do yourself, mm -hmm. but like, you're going to be glad you have it done when it's done. Yeah. Um, but ultimately like when I onboard people to work with me, I let them define their success. Yeah. I don't, I'm not going to tell them what they need to do to be successful. Like, what do you want your business to look like? Okay, well let's try these things that are available mm -hmm. to get there. Or maybe there's these books you can read or these resources we can try out, but I'm very data driven. I'm very like, I want to gamify things, make it a little bit more fun. Keep your business interesting to you because if everything is just like this, you know, oh my God, I have to like wake up and like my business is killing me. It's like, oh God, that's not why we did this. This isn't why we signed up for it. So building sustainability into the business, automating things. Um, the framework of my business is three pieces that work together. I'm going to say that again. They work together. Um, it's business development. So finding and acquiring clients. Um, automating your systems. So and that's really heavy on client services as well. It's like automating, but automating what? And it's going to be automating kind of like this hospitality approach to your clients, having that empathy, having that curiosity, building in things around them and their workflows so that your workflow actually is like coming from a place of service mm -hmm. and not like putting something on your clients that like actually doesn't work for them. Um, and then pricing. That's like a big thing that I like to talk about. It's like you know, I talked about like, what's the fastest path to profitability. So I've designed like these three calculators that you can use to basically find out how much you need to be charging, put your horse blinders on, define what your life looks like, put your personal budget in, put your business budget in, you have your numbers, you can set the profit you want to make. And then, um, you know, this calculator is going to tell you what you should charge if you want to go per image or if you want to do a uh, half day or day rate, it's going to tell you what your fastest path to profitability is. Um, just using those numbers and then you can add your a la carte options and like once those kind of start rolling yeah. when you quantify each one you can figure out how much you need to sell mm -hmm. how quickly and how like how frequently to reach pro your what you define as a successful profit so yeah. um, I think having realistic numbers like if you say like I want to make 300k in profit this year it's like okay you're gonna have to charge like fifty thousand dollars per photo shoot or whatever it is yeah, or, you or multiply the amount of shoots you're doing whatever somehow. it is yeah, yeah. so um, which, you know, it's possible you can, you can work a ton. Like that's, that's, you set that up. Like 
there's things like how many months do you want to work? How many days do you want to work? And what do you want your profit to be? Based on your budget side of the equation, it'll pump all of that out for you. So then you can kind of say like, does that number sound good to me? Is that what I want to tell people I charge? And, um, you know, that's, that's just one piece of the mentorship. That's just data that we use to say, okay, so now when we get in front of a client, we're on a sales call, how do we make this number be less about the number and more about like the value in the service and kind of calming the client down and like solving their problems. And so, um, that's a big part of what my mentorship is. And I only take people who really want to do it. I don't really market it a lot. And this goes back to the very beginning of what we, um, talk about. I host the monthly photography calls. I genuinely want to help people free call. It's like sometimes 90 minutes, whatever it is, two hours. Um, Give people a place to like come and just like workshop things. I usually I said theme, so tonight we have one. It's more. It's I've been a part of a few. Yeah. It's more conversational. It's not like you. Um, no. I'm no. You're, not to. you're not like <laughs> lecturing everybody. No. I mean, you'll share. Yeah. And then I'll get kind the of conversation like, started. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. You facilitate it. But like even on the last call, like I knew that I was launching like another session of this May first. So I have I think I have three spots left. Um, I sold one this morning, so I think it's two or three left. Um. I'm starting it on May 1st and I didn't even on the last call say to anybody in the group, Hey, I'm launching this and I have spots open because I don't want people to feel like they come to me and they're like, I'm going to sell them something. I'll put it in the footer of my email. Like, Hey, this is going on. Call me, email me if you actually want to talk about it. Cause I don't want people to feel like that's why they're there. I'm not, I'm, they're not on my email list for me to like make money off of them. If they want help and they decide that like what I have to offer can help them, great. Like that's a mutual buy-in, but I'm not creating a mentorship with yeah. like this like full, I'm not trying to be like a. Yeah, yeah, I understand. It's just not my style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where can people, just your website? Yeah, mollyrosephoto.co, unfortunately. And then mollyrose.photo on Instagram. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Well, I'm sure everybody who's watching is already following you. I hope so. And I've tied you. We have, we have. Yeah. We have, we have we sh we share, we're part of the same audience. community for the yeah. most part. You know yeah. what I mean? Like we have, like we've interacted with I a lot of same people. together. Like, well, I mean, kind of like, yeah. I think, I think it's important to have like people, I, I tend to gravitate towards people who put themselves out there. Yeah. Like, and it's not so much because I don't know, like, well, one, I admire people who can put themselves out there, whether it's free stuff, paid stuff, it doesn't matter. Like it takes a lot of guts and courage to like. So what? Just put yourself out there. Do it. So what? If, yeah. you're, if you're like wishing that you were in this podcast, e like email Jordan and be like, so what if he doesn't pick me? So what if he picks me? Just go out and do stuff. Go be part of the yeah. community. Go out, go out and be part of the community and contribute. So what? I, I, yeah, I think, I think you just have to contribute whether, I don't know, it doesn't matter, but like yeah. I gravitate towards people to do that because I want to, I don't know, like I, I think everybody should share more out there. Like we can learn from everybody no matter what skill level you're at, like everybody has different life experiences. Mm -hmm. Kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, it's like everything we do is like circumstantial. Yeah. Like everybody has something to contribute. Yeah. So I don't know. Everybody's anyway. different. They have different needs. Yeah. You know, I, I may not need, maybe I don't need any help with branding, but I might need a ton of help with editing or something. I don't know. Somebody else doesn't is like a whiz in photography, can't sell their services for the life of them. You know, that's why we have to, talk yeah. to each other and support each other because we all have different competencies. And, and what's crazy is like, if this was a corporate world, yeah, we would all be working together. We, mm -hmm. So we just need to create our own, our own system for sharing information and our own, like there has to be trust there. There has mm -hmm. to be trust there. That's why like you and I have some haters, I think, cause we are willing to kind of say things that maybe people want to keep under the rug. Like, well that, and also I think that people like us just share, and sometimes, like we talked a little bit about this, about this earlier, like I'll just say things that are kind of on my mind, but they're not, they're not always necessarily like well thought out. Mm -hmm. They're kind of just like, I explore ideas a lot, yeah. you know, and I like, totally. I, I like trying new things. And like you said earlier, you can pivot very quickly. Yeah. I can also pivot very quickly. Yeah. It's like my mind changes a lot about things. Oh, I never you say know? never. I yeah. cannot say never. Yeah. I mean, I can say I'll never like divorce Zach, that I can say yeah. with certainty, but I will never say, oh, I'll never do that in my business because you don't know. Yeah. Like, you know, I'm not even gonna, I, I'm gonna stop myself off ahead. <laughs> I, will, yeah. I won't say never in my business. Yeah, 
Well, thanks for inviting me into your house. Yeah, thanks and for coming over. Getting, this was put lovely. It, put it, getting the good pillows The nice out. pillows out. Yeah. Like, people should know, I don't keep these pillows on my couch because of all my animals. So these are, like, in another room, and I have just ugly Target pillows on my couch most of the time. But these are my pretty pillows. My mom made these for me. So. Oh, did she? Yeah. That's awesome. Or she had them made. Yeah. Cool. So they're my mama pillows. Cool. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thanks again for having me over. Thank you. Thanks for coming.